Yeah, hello, you 87, 88, 89. Wow, we're getting more people in right at the bell. That's fantastic. Uh, you 90 brave souls who are here to uh, care about performance tuning and troubleshooting Azure SQL database. Um, as my abstract uh, for this talk kind of indicated, one of the things I want to help people get their minds around is that there's not that much difference between Azure SQL database and the databases that we have on-prem. So that's kind of my goal today is to try and demystify some of this. As I was telling Liz just a few moments ago, my mouse has died on me. So I'm doing everything clicking on that little tiny pad on the laptop. So forgive me if some of my motions uh, are a little bit delayed and, and run down. Unfortunately, uh, the Bluetooth adapter actually melted uh, somehow in my travel bag, and uh, and so the the mouse has power, but yeah, unfortunately that uh, I've never had a, a USB stick melt before inside of a mouse. That was really interesting. All right, here's me. If you're here, you, you probably know me. I'm Bradley Ball. I won't spend a lot of time on myself. I'm a former MVP. I'm the former data practice data practice manager or data platform practice manager for Pragmatic Works. Uh, my good friends here. We have a lot of great webinars coming up. You saw some of those on the title as Liz and I were talking back and forth. Um, Roland Goslin's got some great stuff coming up. I, I saw some Power BI boot, uh, boot camps and also the data science workshops. I know all the folks who made those, so please make sure and take a look at those. Um, they do a fantastic job creating the content and also delivering them. Uh, I'm currently a senior consultant for Microsoft Premier Support for Developer. Um, what that is, is we are actually the best kept secret within Microsoft. There are tens of thousands of uh, Microsoft Consulting Services folks. Uh, we have thousands of PFEs. Uh, there are only 50 of us over at PSF FD. And uh, basically, they, they hire in very senior folks who are highly specialized. And we help com uh, customers. And also, uh, we help uh, with a development twist on things. So that way, we can help people as they're actually developing the code. So enough about that. Let's drive straight into this. I'm going to try and hustle through the slides pretty quick. And then what we're going to do is we're going to break down into a collection and a set of demos. I need to be able to get all this together um, to put online later. So it's probably going to take me the better part of this week to get that organized. Because uh, as you'll see, I've, I've got code sitting all over the place for this. So we're going to talk about the differences between SQL Server and Azure Database. We're going to talk about how you could collect Perfmon data uh, from Azure SQL Database. We're going to talk about how you review weight statistics, scaling hardware, the query store, and tuning indexes. So first up, SQL is from Venus and Azure is from Mars, right? The cloud seems very, very far away. And that makes things sometimes feel out of our reach. There are very simple things that we would like to do that it might clear to us how uh, intuitive it is to actually work with the cloud and be able to um, get SQL Azure stood up. We understand how we install SQL Server, but there might be some gaps when it comes to understanding how we actually provision SQL Azure databases. Other people manage it. Um, I don't get to install my instance. I don't get to configure the different little things, set the trace flags I would like to set, um, choose where my data files are going. Um, there's a lot that seems like it's out of my control. Um, connecting to it might not always be straightforward. Um, it, I might have a little gap in my knowledge of how I actually connect up to a SQL Azure database um, and how I get that working and running. It is so different. And what in Sam Hill is a DTU? Well, things to keep in mind. The cloud seems far away. Well, it's just another data center. The fact is, whatever SQL Server applications that you're working on, unless you're building a demo box, you probably don't have the server sitting underneath your desk. Desk, And if you do, you need to make sure that you're not working for Hillary, because that didn't work out too well for the last guy. Um, typically, you've got a data center, and it's very far away. And other people are managing that physical hardware. I may be able to install something on a VM, and you know what? You can still do that on an IaaS VM, but it makes things seem a little bit different. But the, the fact of the matter is, this is just a platform where I'm provisioning a database instead of installing an individual instance. Other people manage it. Actually, you manage it. One of the really amazing things about Azure is the way the portal is set up. People at Microsoft do not have access to your data. I'm going to repeat that because that's important. People at Microsoft do not have access to your data. I can look at performance met metrics for how a server is running. Um, I make sure that the 
it, you know, we have folks that make sure that data center is actually working really well, but I don't go in and tune your database. There's a lot of automated features that you can turn on yourself or you can do it the old fashioned way. You manage your data when it's sitting up in Azure. Collecting and creating a DB is not straightforward. Um, we're going to cover this one. It's actually pretty straightforward. You know, stop, stop yelling, get off my lawn. This is easy. I'm going to show you. It's, it's really easy for us to do. Uh, it's so different. It's, it's really not. Um, the same info is available mostly. There's a subset of perform counters that are not available. There's a subset of extended events that are not available. Um, all you have to do is go in and play around with it. There's actually some DMV specifically available for your database um, and for the information that you want to collect on an instance. And then what in the Sam Hill is a DTU? This is a really great question and we're going to make sure and cover this because it's important to understand what a DTU is. So when we tune SQL Server, how do you assess your SQL Server performance on-prem? Well, typically we use something called the weights and cues methodology. We look at weight stats, we might query perfmon and performance metrics, we might look at the plan cache then to be able to dive a little bit deeper and figure out exactly what's going on within our SQL Server. How do I do this on Azure SQL Database? Well, the same weight stat scripts that Paul Randall puts out there that we all know and love, I'm going to run on MySQL Azure Database. And the fantastic thing is they link over to the weight stats repository. So that way if I have a weight and I need to figure out what's going on with that, I can click over and do it. And there are some specific weights that correspond to SQL Azure Database. There are plenty more that just correlate to SQL Server in general. I still have a plan cache. This is still SQL Server. Uh, my Queries are compiled, they run through the query optimizer, they are placed in the plan cache. I have SysDM exec plans uh, if I, I want to go to that DMV and be able to get that information. And as far as perfmon, perfmon, one of the things we're going to do is while we can't use perfmon itself and perfmon counters, what is exposed is through SysDM OS performance counters. And there are perfmon counters that are exposed through there. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of the demo of, of how to pull some of that information down. Uh, I'll be honest, I did not get as far on that demo as I would like to. <clears throat> and I will end up working on something that I eventually blog about that we can put out there. But I'm going to show you how you would be able to go and grab that information. Essentially what you do is you throw it in a flat file and then you would analyze it. It's pretty easy for you to either throw in a database structure or to throw into Power BI, uh, make a nice little line graph and be able to go, oh, well, this is what my perfmon counters are saying is going on on my server. Essentially, we're just doing it by grabbing that information, but we're not using the perfmon utility. And then a DTU is a database transition unit. So what is a DTU? This is the logical representation of the physical units of work that are done by our database. So how many DTUs do you need? Well, there's actually a DTU calculator. So if you've got an on-prem workload and you go, hey, we're considering moving up to SQL Azure DB and I want to make sure that I size this correctly, I know the number of DTUs that I need. What you want to do is you want to run a perfmon and you want to collect processor information, logical disk reads, logical disk writes, uh, and then database log bytes flushed per second. Now by looking at those, what can you discern from a DTU? Well, first off, it's the amount of processor time I'm going to need. It probably also, because this processor has a corresponding value with memory, and depending on the number of DTUs I need and also the tier of the database I want to use, it's the amount of reads and writes that I'm doing. So I will open up one of my databases. I'll show you some of the different SKUs that we have available. But keep in mind that a DTU and a SKU, this is essentially just the physical hardware that's um, underlying your database. And so what I'm trying to do is go, hey, here's a DTU that we can actually run on. But the nice thing is, unlike once I set up my server and I'm kind of stuck to the hardware that I have, with my DTUs, I can ratchet that up, I can ratchet it down based off what my utilization actually works out to be. So when we scale hardware, how do you scale up your hardware on-prem? You buy a bigger box, you add more RAM, you add more memory. So how do you scale hardware for SQL Azure Database? You increase your DTUs.
you might move to a premium SKU for premium storage. Whenever you see a P designation uh, for uh, a SQL Azure database, it means I'm using a premium account. I'm going to get a little more compute. I'm going to be using underlying um, SSD storage, and the amount of bandwidth that you get is determined by your skill. So let me break that down a little bit for you. SQL, or sorry, Azure within Azure data centers have a terabyte back, back plane. That means I can get terabyte copy speeds. But if I gave everybody terabyte copy string speeds, well, we'd all be running through the same door at the exact same time. We'd get stuck in there. So what I've got to do is I've got to provision that out. And the way I do that is I do that by SKU. The more premium your SKU, the more network speed that you're going to get. A good ex um, experience to test this out would be to go stand up a DS series VM with premium storage. If I get a um, DS1, I probably will get about 125 megabytes per second for my reads and writes on that premium storage. If I go up to a P2 or a P4, I can very easily at that, I'm sorry, uh, a DS4, uh, um, then I can very easily get 256 megabytes per second on the same storage. The level of disk IOPS is just a little bit throttled because the storage and the computer are disconnected. So the big thing to remember is when you need more physical power, you need more DTUs. And remember from what we're looking at to determine our DTUs, it's CPU and it's the number of reads and writes that I'm going to do. So that will tell me how intense a workload is. When I tune indexes, where do I go? I go to our buddy Jason Strait. I'm going to use SP Index Analysis. Now, there's also some really nice built-in features with Azure itself, and I'm going to show you those. But the great thing is, and I've talked with Jason about this many times, Jason's scripts run on SQL Azure. Um, if you go get an SP Index Analysis, and I'll show you this, the only thing that you have to change is it says use master, and it tries to deploy it in the master database. Well, you don't want to put it in master. What you want to do is you want to put it in the local database that you're using. Remember the context of many things, and this will be very obvious when we begin looking at SSMS. <laughs> the context of many things is located within the database for SQL Azure DB. And how would I query plan cache uh, on-premise? Well, I'd, I'd use SysDM exec plans. I'd use SysDM exec query plan. I may use SysDM exec query stats. I've got all these different DMVs. There's a lot of fantastic scripts out there. Jonathan Cahayas has great um, scripts using uh, cache plans uh, to be able to go out and find the parallelism score of, of different plans that you have within a running system. Kindle Van Dyke has a great one where it goes out and it finds every single plan that has a bookmark lookup. Jason Strait has a really great one that goes out and it looks for anything that has implicit conversion labeled within the query plan. The great thing is all of these queries still work. The troubleshooting mechanisms that you use for on-prem, you can typically use for SQL Azure database. Yeah, and plus you have the the query store. And this is a big boom. If you go to using SQL Azure DB, I want you to think about wherever you are as a shop, and maybe we should have asked a poll question asking what version of SQL Server that, that you were sitting on. I didn't think about this while we were sitting there, but it would have been fantastic to know because if you're not on SQL Server 2016, you don't have the query store. However, if you go up and you begin using SQL Azure database, you immediately have the query store that you can turn on and you can begin utilizing. There's no extra charge for this with the exception of the storage that you're going to need for the query store um, to be able to house the data within it. Uh, the rest of what you end up covering for the price of the DTUs or the, the tier of the database you're using uh, is already included in the price. Oh, sorry about that. Got a couple pop-ups, there we go. Make those go away. So when we look at the query store, um, if you're not familiar with it, I want to run through a little bit about it real quick. What are the options that we have today? Uh, most of our solutions are uh, reactive in nature. If you have a bad plan, um, you might not find out, uh, you don't necessarily get to uh, persist that data amongst restarts. If something hops up and it grabs all of your resources, it could crash the system, and then what happens? When it crashes the system, it flushes out of the plan cache. So what we want to do is we want to use proactive solutions. Um, 
the query store gives us the capability to be able to <clears throat> determine the information or determine the queries that have run uh, historically, what large resources uh, were being used, what our top consuming processes were. Um, and the great thing is this provides a history to us. And it also shows us as plans are, are recompiled differently what the difference is or what the data skew was in those different plans as they were executed. So when we look at the query store, what this does is it persists the execution plan per database. This is going to be able to give us runtime stats to be able to store and persist execution statistics per database. Uh, it gives us some nice views and graphical interfaces that allow you to quickly and easily troubleshoot performance. Every DMV that is available to you for the query store uh, within SQL Server 2016 and is also available to you in SQL Azure database. I have the query store turned on standard level databases. I have the query turned on premium level databases and I'll show you that for both of them. Plans and execution plans are stored on disk in, a user, in the user database. There is a portion of your database that will be reserved for the, um, for the query store. You can flush this out at any point in time. If you do, you'll you lose that historical information. You can configure it and say this is the max amount of space I want um, to be utilized for the query store. It can also be managed uh, via scripts or SSMS. All right, let's get straight over to our demos. Now that we're through all the boring stuff. So first up, what I'm going to do, let me disconnect and, and connect real quick. I've got a database that I've set up. And it's a server instance. And I don't have Zoom it on. So forgive me while I get that on real quick. There we go. And uh, this is my, my server instance right here, SQL Balls. Uh, three right there uh, and then obviously I've, I've got my username right here it's really interesting using this on the mouse pad I'm gonna go ahead and connect to the connect to this instance and then I'm gonna start running a couple demos I'm also gonna show you some stuff out in the portal so when I look at this here are the databases that I currently have in place so let's see we're going to focus on these two databases right here. Um, basically, I did <clears throat> I did not like the AdventureWorks Azure sample that they have out in the cloud. I wanted more data. I wanted more structures, and uh, I also wanted this to run with the SQL Random Workload Generator that I blogged about recently. <clears throat> and what I've done is I've modified that, and I, ha I haven't published the code for it, and I will soon. But I've modified that to be able to run that same workload running against. Um, uh, a SQL Azure database and so I'm going to do that here now my S Azure right here is an S2 database and I'll show you that and then I've got a P4 database sitting right here for my Azure 2 so real quick let's take a look though if I wanted to actually create this let's say I wanted to create something from scratch what I would do is the first thing I would do is I need to create a SQL server Let's see, there we go, right there. This SQL server actually then allows me to be able to create SQL databases. And all our SQL databases have to sit on a server. So if I look at my SQL servers, I currently have two. One is in North Europe, one is in South Central US. I could create a new server if I wanted to, in which case, I would then determine the different geographical location that I wanted, what the server name was. Uh, I would set up my admin login and password um, if I wanted to add it to a resource group. And you may be asking, what is a resource group? So the resource group allows me to be able to group all of my resources within one type of location. So whenever I have an Azure data center, one of the things to keep in mind, this is about a mile long data center. And there are actually two data centers made up of every single Azure region. So that way we have two separate buildings for redundancy. That means if I provision something and I just kept provisioning in the US South, I could be in DC1 or I could be in DC2. Now we have dark fiber in between them. The connection speed is really, really close. But as you all know, if I want to specify 
where I want my resources to be created, I probably want to keep my application and I want to keep my database close to one another. So I would create a resource group, group for my SQL Azure database, but I would also make sure that any application I created in Azure was also sitting within this resource group because when they are provisioned within Azure, we actually take a look at that to make sure that we provision the services very close to one another so that there's minimum latency with applications talking to servers. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole process of, of making a server because I already have two. Once I do that, though, I can come and I can create a database. And when I create a database, I'm going to need to say, what is the, um, the resource group and where is the server that I want to put this on? And let's just say, Mac Demo 1. I could create a new server or I could use any of my new my servers right there. If I want to look at my pricing tier, this is where I start to look at my individual power. See here's those DTUs right there. If I come down to the bottom, I've got my basic which is only five DTUs. Our Azure instance is running as an S2, it has 50 DTUs. And then I've also got a P4 running that has 500 DTUs. The nice thing is once I actually have my databases, okay, yep, we're going to discard those because we don't want to keep any anything we've created. Once I, I go in here, I can actually take a look and I have a lot of information that I can play around with. You can see here's some resource utilization, and I've got other graphs down here. I can take a look at performance recommendations. I can look at connections. I can look at failures versus successful connections. I don't have geo-replication currently configured within this database because this is just me doing demos. I can change things. SKUs to overviews. Here's my performance. Let's go into the performance overview real quick. I could look at different queries and the way they're break, broken down. This is essentially using the query store, telling me what different queries were used. I could begin to click on this information and I could get additional information about the individual queries. This is all using Power BI. I could look over the last 24 hours, past week, past month, things of that nature. I have additional tuning options, auto tuning. What can I auto-tune? I can automatically allow SQL Server to create indexes or drop indexes if they find they are not performing for us. That's pretty good. I can also turn those off because it's pretty darn easy to be able to turn those off. But I've got a lot of really great information sitting here. Now one of the things I've done is I've got these different graphs here, and if you wonder how I get any of these, if you go into your SQL Azure database and you're not seeing them, I've got this little button right here where I can add tiles. And if I click Add Tiles, I could do it by resource group, I could do it by type. If I go into type, I can see all the different types of services that are available. MySQL databases, SQL databases, pretty much everything you could think. I'm going to look at what's available for my SQL databases. And right away, it will pop up these different categories. Now, what I did was I added some. And so let me do this one. Let's say here's my storage hero. And then... Let's see, here's my database size, and then done customizing. And what I can see is that I can have a 250 gigabyte database right here, and I'm currently only using 275 megabyte. Um, I can also see for my total database size if I have any growths. Now, this is all exposed from DMVs underneath the scene that we're using Power BI to essentially graph these. When I look at my desktop, and we're going to go through this in a minute, I can see some, oh, I can see some information about my different servers. You can see I was playing around uh, with these right here. 
and you can see that this is my resource utilization uh, for my Azure database, which is my S2, and also for my Azure 2, which is my, um, my P4. I've also got connections for both of them, and let's say I didn't have these here, and I wanted to add them. What I could do is I could go back to my SQL Azure database, and any of these graphs that I have internally, I could just drag and drop right out here. Or I can also add them to, all right, enough clicking. I, I can also add them to the desktop. I'm sorry, this was a little bit easier when I had a mouse and I wasn't doing this out of a keypad. But I, I was able just to uh, sit there and drag and drop uh, doing that. So anyway, I'm going to let the demo gods bite me on that one. Now, let's go and actually run a couple things. So I've got my connections here. And just to show how easy it is to create a database, I could go into Azure, I could create a database. There's many things I could specify just from T-SQL. But I could also use the standard old syntax that we have right here. So let me go ahead and just do a quick run of sysdatabases. You can see that I'm connected to my master instance by default. I'm also connected to my instance for SQL Azure DB. Here's my different database IDs. You can see I don't have Microsoft Demo anywhere in here. Um, this syntax works just fine. If exists, drop it. If it doesn't, create it. Forgive me, I'm running over uh, hotel Wi-Fi while I'm doing this. So. This is a little bit faster when I'm actually at home and plugged into a network or using my site to site. Ah, the fun of a hotel. Hopefully everybody's leaving for the conference soon and my Wi-Fi will speed up a little bit. All right, so I'm going to let that run. While that runs, um, once it finishes up, I'll show you that I have it. I can just say select all from sys databases and my database is sitting out there and provisioned. I can also see what type of tier it is. I could go back out. I could look at some of the GUI options. Again, I could configure things via T-SQL. But it's not that different. So let's take a look at some DMVs. Oh, that looks like we finally finished. So come back over, select all from sys databases. There we go. Here's Microsoft. Demo one, I can see some of the default things that just came in place and how it was established. So, and I can also go back out and I'll let that run for a moment and I can drop that database. Now, looking at additional DMVs we've got that you might not have expected that you could access. I've got access to SysDM OS schedulers. So, if I wanted to go ahead and run this, I can see anything that's hidden online and also visible online for this individual instance. I can take a look at the buffer descriptors and I can also correlate that. I can run Glenn Berry's scripts to be able to see, hey, how many pages do I have sitting out for particular objects, indexes, uh, per database, how much is actually using the individual buffer pool so I know what are my busiest databases. Select DMOS wait stats. We're going to look at this a little bit more in a minute, but I've got it right here. The other interesting thing is I actually have database level wait stats. I want you to think about that for a minute. There's actually a DMV where if instead of running Paul's script blanketly against the entire SQL Server instance, I said I just want to understand what my wait stats for this individual database are. Um, it's got all the same columns. All I have to do is change to use the DMDB OS wait stats DMV. And then let's take a look at performance counters because this is the way that we're going to get that performance information. I've got a lot of different 
performance counters that are available to me. But this is still only a subset of what we actually have available if we went to somewhere where we actually were able to um, figure the, um, uh, sorry, if we were able to configure the hardware and have access to the server. So to take a look at some of these objects, if I do a select distinct object name from system OS performance counters order by, or, uh, by object name, you can see that I don't have a lot of server level counters here, but I have everything I need to be able to monitor um, the performance that I have for my in-memory OTP, because these are the XTP counters right there. Remember, XTP stands for Extreme Transaction Processing. Uh, the product team was trying to guess what the marketing team was going to call um, in-memory OTP. They decided not to do Hackathon. They decided not to do uh, Extreme Transaction Processing. In memory OLTP was the one that got stuck. Here's a, a view of some of the additional counters that we've got. We've got databases, we've got latches, we've got locks, we've got memory brokers, memory manager, memory nodes, access math, methods. There's a lot of information that we typically would want to come in here and capture uh, for our SQL Server instance, buffer manager, things like that, SQL statistics, transactions per second, that if you want to, you could go out and get this information. Now, you're going to need a method to be able to pull this information together. This is what I didn't have time to uh, finish, and I wanted to, uh, but I, I just didn't have time. Eventually, what this will be is I'm going to be working on a store procedure where I can go out and get that information, and I've got a command window that's just going to allow me to be able to get that specific information uh, and put it in an output file. Whenever I have this finished, I'll probably publicly make it available, but as of right now, I'm just basically saying, hey, execute this script and do an output. So what do I need to do? Well, I need a date timestamp associated with it, and then I need to do a loop, and then I'm going to need to be able to consume this data. Let me run that. So this is just a quick example. This is just doing a select against to be able to populate um, the data. But you can see what I'm going for here. It'll, it'll have the uh, server name, um, some output, and then I'll have some informational messages. Uh, there we go. This is a little bit wide, but I'll have the different counters, what we've got, what the counter actually is, and then the date of collection. So that way we can sit down and we can actually begin to look at how do we then show the lines and the graphs, how does this correspond with those DTUs, because we actually have the capability to go out and get the majority of this information. It's not as straightforward as I would like yet, and like I said, that's that's why I'm building something like that. If somebody else wants to beat me to it and maintain it, I would absolutely love it, and if there's already something out there like that, then please let me know so I don't have to sit here and build it. Um, but I, I could not find anything even close to this, which is why I, I figured, why the heck not start building it and make it available to the SQL community. Uh, let's see, so... Yeah, let's do another one real quick. So this is Paul Randall's wait stats script. All, all credit to Paul right up there, uh, Google or Bing. Uh, Paul Randall, wait stats, please tell me where it hurts. Uh, the thing that I absolutely love is that Paul has uh, included links to sqlskills.com, uh, help wait stats to the wait stats repository that's been created. And so if I go out and I run this, I can see that here's my number one wait stat, resource governor idle, and I've got a link to it. I've got IO completion up next, XE file target, SOS scheduler yield, preemptive wait, and if I wanted to begin running this per individual database to figure out what was going on with the individual database uh, wait stats, all I would need to do is change the DMV that this is pointing to um, in Paul's script. And it's a fantastic way for me to then go, okay, you know, what's an I.O. completion? Most of us would know what that is, but the great thing is if you don't, you get this link right here. Throw it in the window. Wheel of morality, turn, turn, turn. What is the lesson that we must learn? There we go, I.O. completion. 
well, this is a fantastic resource for us to be able to see this is exactly what the description of this weight stat means. Um, questions on this, when do you see it? What are some issues with it? What does this stack call look like uh, when you get it? But understanding of weight stats, typically what this tells you, remember, on a finely tuned workload, weight stats are nothing more than an indicative of what the workload of the server is. SQL Server is always going to be waiting on something. At a point in time, I can't tune a system anymore, then it, it's just going to happen, uh, and I'm going to get those wait stats. If I relieve all disk bottlenecks, um, and I'm sitting there just doing inserts on a system over and over again, I expect that I'm going to see page, late, page latch underscore EX and underscore SH weights. If I'm constantly pushing data out of my buffer manager and reading it off a physical disk, I expect that I'm going to see page IO uh, latch SH and underscore EX. Um, if I've got a workload where I have very evenly used CPU utilization and I have got a lot of parallel queries, I expect to see CX packet weights. However, I don't know if it's a finely tuned workload for any of these weight stats until I actually dig into what the weight stats are. So. That's what these do, is they help us to be able to go, okay, here's SOS scheduler yield. If this was a higher level of percentage of the number of weights that I'm getting, uh, or if I saw that my average weights per second was higher, I would go here. Now, again, I'm looking at this for the entire server, and I have non-premium storage systems uh, where I've managed to work a really hard workload against them. Um, if I go up to premium storage and I take a look at my weight stats for that particular database, I'm going to find that my I.O. completion drops way down. Let's do another one real quick. So I told you that JSON Straits script works here. The only thing you need to do is take out this use master and deploy it in the database you want. So I'm going to put this against my AdventureWorks Azure database. We'll let the contact switch and I'll grab a drink of coffee. And let me scroll down real quick and double check that. All right, everything looks good. Let's run it. And it completed successfully. And now I open up a new query against AdventureWorks underscore Azure. SP, oh, still spinning. And when this runs, I can immediately see, okay, I've got missing index details. I've got index pros and cons for different indexes. If I scroll across, I can see what the buffer percent of this table currently is. I can see the row count. I can see the user total. Now, granted, remember my workload doesn't have a right percentage in it. If it's a missing index, uh, or on my index, sorry, on my physical indexes, I can see my number of seeks, scans. I don't have any lookups in here. Uh, the total number of operations that happen. Let's see, yeah, no lookups right in there. Any lookups? Yeah, here we go. Here's a good one with 708 lookups running right along this index. And what's it telling me? It's telling me I probably need to realign this primary key. I actually have an index recommendation here. But this is JSON script, and it's running in SQL Azure, and I can use it to be able to um, find things like duplicates, and it just works. So this is a fantastic way for me to be able to sit there and tune. And that's one of the biggest things that we end up doing. We tune the same way we've always done. We look at our plan cache. We look at our plans, our store procedures. We look at our indexes, and we figure out how we can make our workload run a little more efficiently. So let's talk about scaling a little bit. I've got a um, DS4 VM sitting here uh, with a nice bunch of cores. And because I'm my, I've already got issues with my Wi-Fi, I didn't want to kick off a, a lot of random workload generators on my machine and potentially cause some latency for us. So 
what I've got is I've got my workload generator in Azure and I created uh, two copies. Now, when I run this, I typically run five and on my two core laptop, five will bring my laptop to its knees, stress me about 100%. If I'm lucky and I've got a good bandwidth connection, I might still be able to talk, uh, but five is about my limit. And so what I decided I was gonna do is I'm going to push my SQL Azure DB a little bit harder. I'm going to create 10 connections to go against it. And it's looking at my exact same script. And you can see we've kicked off. We've got some queries that are running. If I come back over to my desktop, I should see over here pretty soon, my performance begins to pick up. Now, the thing to keep in mind is this DTU percentage right here is the overall amount for this entire surface area. But if I want to know what was going on, say, right there, all I need to do is just hover over it and it'll show me. So for example, if I come to right here, I can see this was using 16.17% DTU. Looking up here, I'm almost pegged at 100% of all of my DTUs. Ah, and you can see here's my workload. It's finally started to come through. It recognizes that I have these connections running. I'm now at 99.22 DTU percentage. One of the things I thought about doing was trying to scale this database on the fly, but that can take sometimes up to um, three to four minutes to provision the new database when I just wanted to be able to run a workload and let you see them side by side. If you've ever needed to make a copy of a database, let me tell you something. It is incredibly easy in SQL Azure um, because all I did was I went over here to this database and I clicked this button right there that said copy. The steps involved were what server do you want it to be on? And here's the new name and you can go ahead and change it and you can change the pricing tier, make it an elastic database pool, things like that nature. Um, I left it alone. I, I just made, put a simple two on the end of it. All right, get this to go away. There we go. Let's get back to over here. So, oh. I may have had something go wrong because it looks like our DTUs took a dive. Let's make sure we're still connected. Let me close these and I'm going to reopen them up. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the exact same workload and I'll get both of these going now against my premium. So I should have 20 total command windows. This, this should begin to pick up across the board. And what we'll see is that I'm pushing an extremely hard workload here. I've got a lot of parallelism. I've got a lot of sorts, aggregations, joins that I'm doing. Um, there's also plenty wrong with these queries. I, I've got a lot of room in here where I could go ahead and fix them. You can see initially we jumped up to 57.55% DTU. Uh, when this comes back through, we'll see where we're going. Oh, looks like I stayed at 99.22, went to 99.52. As this continues to refresh, this is one of those main areas where you would look at for successful connections, who's actually connecting to the database, how many folks are connecting to the database. Um, am I getting any failures? If I get failed connections, I want to begin to investigate what those are, why those happen. Um, if they were timeouts, uh, for example, that I, I have too many people trying to connect, uh, and that's what it was. It's We didn't have a dip off there. We're staying hot and heavy, uh, spiked up at 99%. But this is the example I wanted to show you right now. As we move along, if I wanted to look at this workload, what I would see is that this workload is too much for me to be able to handle on this individual instance. Um, looks like I'm handling this quite a bit better right here. When I was pushing it earlier, I got it up to 80. So let's see 
if that pushes any higher. Next up, let's just take a quick look. I'm connected to these databases, and I'm using SSMS 2016. Remember, SSMS 2016 is decoupled from SQL Server 2016, so it's a download. Um, you, you go up to MSDN, and you download SSMS 2016, and you're up and running. You need SSMS 2016 to be able to do live query view um, uh, or also um, the query store. So let's take a look at where the query store is located. Because you'll notice I don't have a management window right there. But when I come and I look under SQL Azure Database, I, I have some new folders. So external resources is for external tables. With SQL Azure Database, you can make an external table the same way you can an APS, PDW, um, or that you can with SQL Azure DW where I can make an external storage structure and query things and bring them into SQL Server. In SQL Azure, um, I can actually do that on Azure Storage. I could do that for Hadoop. I could do that for multiple different things. Then you can see here's my query store, and here's also my extended events. Now, I can't watch live execution of extended events, but I can have an output file for extended events go to Azure Storage so I can pull it down and actually throw it within the GUI or open it up in SSMS and so that way I can use the GUI tool to be able to aggregate events. Um, that's a, a little bit longer demo than we're going to have time for today. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the query store. Looking at the query store, I can see that I've got request, regressed queries. Oh, that was not what I wanted to do. All right. Here we go. Well, okay, I'm going to skip that. I'll just hover over. I've got regress queries, overall resource consumption, top resource consuming queries, and tracked queries. So let's take a look at our resource consumption. And I haven't had a lot of load running against this, as you can see. Here's, here's my big entry. So let's go ahead and take a look at our resource consumption for right now. And what I can see is I can look at my duration in milliseconds, I can look at it in CPU time, I can look at my execution count. Uh, for this in particular, what I can do is I can click on both of these plans, because I can see it looks like, oh, it looks like I'm getting bitten by the demo guides. Okay, I have two different plans here. Let's see if I can view some metrics in this. And right here, what I'm able to do, let me move that real quick, is I'm actually able to look at the grid, see what the minimum duration was per plan with the max. And if my plans were able to come through, I could get a little better idea of what was going on. Now, I could try and force things because this looked like it was running a lot easier, but I, I would really want the uh, the plan to come through. I'm hitting this right now with a pretty heavy load, so that could be interfering interfering with this uh, request. There we go. I'm able to get the execution plan for this, so I can see here's this plan, and then I have slightly different plan. And one of the things I could do is I could do a comparison. to view either in grid or I could view them in a separate search window. And what I could do is I could try and take a look at this and see if I notice a big difference. Um, I'm not seeing anything right off the bat for both of these. Um, looks like I have a missing index detail on both of them, but I did get quite a bit different performance from these. Anyway, I could start clicking through here and typically what I want to find is I want to find if I've got data skew issues or if I've got an actual difference in the plan that was produced. Anytime I see these do two different IDs, what I'm finding is I have differences in plans. And if I wanted to, because this one appears to be much more efficient, I could force this plan. And if I say yes, Every plan that runs will now use that. Now this is the exact same in SQL Azure Database as well as SQL, um, SQL Server Box product. If I want to unforce the plan, 
Yes. I simply click on, on force and it allows SQL Server to use the plan that will be compiled. And you can see that in that point in time I got a third plan while I forced that. And at any point in time I could select two of these and I could begin to compare them either through the grid or through the plans. If CPU wait stats were one of my number one issues, I could order this by CPU and see if I can figure out what query it is that's causing me the most issues. And it looks like one of these, um, as a matter of fact, it was the one that we forced. And looking at it, I can see why, because I, I have quite a few um, table spools associated with this, multiple threads coming together, and it doesn't look like I have any parallelisms sitting here. But again, these are, are not good queries. These are queries that by design it's meant for us to be able to play around with. Let's see. Yeah, I, I after my initial jump, looks like on my P4 I'm settling in, in the 70s to 80 percent range, but I'm handling this workload. And I'm handling a lot better than I would be if I was sitting over here on my S2. So when you look at leveling performance, one of the key things in leveling performance Understanding DTUs and knowing that if my DTU is too high uh, or it's, it's too low, I need to raise it. Now, conversely, if I tune this database, I could get these DTUs to drop quite a bit. If I'm on a P4, this can be in a very expensive database, and I find I'm only using 40% of it, well, on my next maintenance window, I'm probably going to shift down to a P2. And if at a P2, I'm only using 60%, maybe I stay there, uh, or maybe we even take that down to a P1. What I can do is I can gradually downgrade my database to be able to make sure I'm getting the optimum DTU performance, but I would typically want to correlate that with connections and failures, because I receive more connections, um, uh, possible connections with a different scale. Uh, so you'll want to make sure and correlate that as you make sure that you don't all of a sudden downgrade your database and get a spike in failed connections because you've got a lot of people trying to access your database but now they can't. Let's see. All right, so what do we cover? We cover that SQL is from Mars, Azure is from Venus, uh, but they're really not that far away. Uh, we talked about different ways to be able to collect perform counters, uh, how we review weight stats, scaling hardware, the query store, and tuning indexes. I don't see any questions flashing, Liz. Um, did you get any questions? Uh, we have a couple. Um, okay. Do we not have a temp DB in Azure? Yes, yes, you you have a temp DB in Azure. I I hope that answered that question. <laughs> um, it's unclear as to why we would not. Uh, why we would not want to put Jason's query in the master database in SQL Azure. Ah, uh, okay. So you cannot make a cross uh, database call in um, unless you're using Elastic DBs, and even when using Elastic DBs, you can't make a cross database call to the master database. That is specifically isolated. Um, so if I went to the master database and I, I uh, created a store procedure and I said, um, you know, uh, SP test. And then I went into uh, AdventureWorks 2014 and I said, execute SP um, test. Then it's not going to work. It's going to fail, even if it exists in the master database. But also, you're prohibited from modifying the master database. So, yeah, you not only that, you cannot use the use context. Um, when you're running a query. So I can't say use master do this, uh, create this database, use this database. You'll notice I didn't do that in that demo. Uh, when I put my SQL Azure database uh, workload generator online, one of the things people will, will note from there, uh, there's a lot of places for on-prem where it says use this database over and over and over again to make sure the context is correct. I remove all of that. You specify the database in the connection string and you're going to want to execute in that particular way. So you while you can make some cross database calls in elastic pools, um, for a standard Azure SQL database, you cannot make a cross database call. Great question, though. All right. Um, how would you change the server level of a SQL server in Azure, like going from S2 to a P11? 
Oh, so you don't set that as a server level. That's a that's a database level configuration. So let, let me show you a quick example here. Um, here's my uh, let's see. Here's my SQL servers. If I add a SQL server, I don't pick a particular SKU level here. I, I'm just going to say, here's the location I want to create this. Because you'll notice there's no SKU here. If I go over to a SQL database, which I create on a SQL server, then it will ask me for a SKU. So if I click Add, let's Pragmatic Demo 2. We'll do the balls group. Uh, I'm going to do a blank database. Here's my server, and then I'd specify the server. The only thing that server does is it says, here's the location I want to be in. Um, you can create servers in two different regions and then use um, databases and geo-replication to mimic always-on availability groups to have read-only secondaries that data is being copied to. There's a really great blog on azure.com, and I'm trying to remember who put it out there, but it was... I want to say the 18th of this month. It was something very, very recent, but it showed how to set that up, how to configure it, and how to be able to set your um, application to use read-only secondaries and an automatic redirect. Um, so basically, if you want the ability to offload reads and writes, like with um, always available, I, I'm sorry, always available. Uh, I think I just created a new always. Uh, if you wanted to be able to do that uh, like you can with always on, you can do that with SQL Azure DB. Right. Ready for the next one? But, oh, sorry. Yep, <laughs> uh, can we use SQL Profiler in Azure? You cannot. I was actually searching for the blog this morning. Um, I know I've got the script downloaded somewhere, uh, and I, I want to get it out there. But there's a gentleman on Azure.com, and what he showed was if you turned on, bless you, uh, the <laughs> query store, you were able to actually run queries against the query store to see by order of operations what statements actually occurred. Um, and you can essentially create uh, or, or you can mimic a profiler trace, but you need to have the query store on, and you're going to need to do that through T-SQL. Um, but unfortunately, there is no tool right now um, that allows you to be able to do profiler. But if you do have the query store on and you use T-SQL, you can get basically the same information that you were attempting to get from a profiler trace. You've also got the capability, um, and this may run slow because I've still got the workload going, so let me do it over here. Uh, Okay, extended events. All right. Uh, I'm trying to get the wizard. Sorry, it's very difficult without the mouse. But you actually have templates available um, in SQL Azure database, very similar to the templates that are available um, on-prem. And there's one that mimics profiler. Now, I'll, I'll be dead honest, uh, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to set up a, an Azure Blob Storage account. You're going to want to, and I'm, I'm having trouble getting this to come up, sorry. Um, what you would do is you would create a, a Blob Storage account. Uh, yeah, it's too busy right now. Okay, I just need to, either that or I had a problem with my connection. Uh, you can get a template to come up. Essentially, there's one that, um, one of the templates mimics um, gathering uh, either RBC completed or um, batch queries completed. So you can create a similar thing to a profiler trace that's already there on-prem. You're essentially creating the same thing, but you're going to want the output to go to blob storage so you can then pull down um, that .xel file uh, and look at it with, um, with SSMS to be able to look at the extended events in that way. All right. Uh, I guess we have time for one more question. Um, do you think that yeah. Azure lessens the need for advanced CBAs in the corporate infrastructure? Sorry, could you say that again? Sure. They want to know if you think that Azure lessens the need for advanced DBAs in the corporate infrastructure. Oh, no. 
No, I don't. And it's it's funny because I've met a lot of people who have told me we're going to go to uh, people are going to go to SQL Azure and they're not going to need DBAs anymore. If you are a DBA that all you ever did was watch um, SQL Agent and look at error logs, then yeah, they're not going to need you. If you're if you know how to tune T SQL, if you know what wait stats are, and you know how to correlate those with perfmon counters, and how that works out to hardware, and how that works out to scale, um, if you've actually got more skills than just going, I can diagnose this hardware in this instance, they are absolutely going to need you. Um, if I've got a thousand databases for an organization, and I move them all up to or Azure, well, Azure can do a lot of things, but it's not the self-tuning mecca that we, the individual humans, are. You're still always going to need people that understand how to tune queries, how to collect information, how to collect stats. Um, that is is never going to go out, out of style. Um, those skills which you see on display very heavily at pretty much every SQL Saturday in the past summit, uh, every SQL conference that you want to go to, um, those are the, the ones that you need to understand, that you need to, to learn and know. Um, still going to be important to uh, understand and know how to use indexing. So, uh, no, I, I don't see Azure at all being able to, I think, uh, I'm trying to say this nicely, I think stupid executives that do not know the difference between a technical resource um, as a human being and a technical resource of what's on a computer, they may think they can go to Azure and save money, uh, but I think anybody who's actually ever worked in IT that understands the work that goes into monitoring and maintaining a system um, will realize that you can't get rid of people just because I migrated from one data center to another. Um, and as you see more people from with IT backgrounds uh, become uh, more and more parts of the executive leadership uh, within companies, you're, you're going to see that mindset lesson. It's just people without an IT mindset often think that, hey, I can get rid of advanced knowledge by going to Azure. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. It's already a little after ending time, so we'll go ahead and close it out and let Brad get back to the start of his day. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Brad, for hosting. It's always good to talk to you since no we don't have you in the office anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Liz, and thanks for having me. And uh, thank you, everybody, for all the folks who came out. Yep, and thanks, and thanks everybody. And just a reminder, uh, you'll get an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.